Thank you very much, Fred, for the introduction. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, real pleasure to have see so many faces despite the cold. Um, so what I would like to do is talk a little bit about black holes. Um, and I think we, we can all agree that this is a very exciting subject, very exciting object, something that we don't really know about. It's a very, there's this kind of romantic and enigmatic idea to black holes. And what I would like to do is just kind of do a little journey through uh, three different aspects of the study of black holes. And it all started about 250 years ago from a very theoretical perspective, uh, when somebody just said, what if? And then I'll talk a little bit about um, the more the mathematical uh, ideas of black holes, so just the mathematical formulations. Uh, but these two kind of aspects of black holes I will talk very briefly. Uh, what I will concentrate for the rest of the talk will be the physical properties of black holes. How do we actually see them? How do we know they are there? How do we study them? Uh, so, you know, the, the vast majority of the talk is going to be um, a, a lot more physical. So, where do we start? I think the, it's only fair to start uh, talking about gravity. Okay, so there's not going to be a lot of equations in my talk. There will be a few, and I will try to walk everybody through them, but you know, a very important equation here is the escape velocity. You know, what is the escape velocity? Why do I have a title saying the big G? Well, because it's extremely important, and we all, we're all very aware of the idea of, you know, having, finding it very hard to escape from Earth because we've all seen rockets being launched, and we know they need to be accelerated to very high speeds in order to be able to escape from the gravitational attraction of Earth. So, mathematically, how much do we really need to accelerate? How fast do we need to be going to escape from the gravitational attraction of an object? And that's defined by the escape velocity, which is just 2 gm over r, where m is the mass. Okay, so if we plug in a couple of numbers there, and I'll be talking a lot about the solar mass. So the solar mass is just the mass that the sun ha has. And I will be talking about, um, from now on, I will definitely be using this unit of one solar mass. Okay, so every time I say something is 10 times the mass of the sun, it just means that. It's 10 times the mass of the sun, and the mass of the sun is about 340,000 times the mass of Earth. So it's very massive. And we also know the radius of the sun, which is about 110 times the radius of Earth. And if you were to just plug in those numbers, you know, g is a constant, plug in the mass of the sun, plug in the radius of the sun, what we have is escape velocity of around 620 kilometers per second. If we were to do the same thing for Earth, we find that the escape velocity of Earth is around 11 kilometers per second. So if we want to you know, have a rocket that will escape the gravitational attraction of Earth, you need to be going faster than 11 kilometers per second. So I guess like one of those obvious things that you can think about is if this is the equation that uh, links escape velocity, and we know that we need to be traveling faster than this, this velocity in order to escape the gravitational attraction of an object, how massive does an object need to be in order for this velocity to be equal to the speed of light. Right? So that's a, a thought experiment that was actually thought about um, by Reverend John Mitchell in 1784. At the time, he was uh, at Queen's College in Cambridge, which is the same college that I went to. Uh, and he is a reverend. He's a reverend, was a reverend, and he was also better known as the father of seismology. So his real passion was geology. Yet one night he was just thinking about this, and he actually wrote this letter to uh, Henry Cavendish. And you, you'll be able to read here. It says, if there should really exist in nature anybody whose density is not less than that of the sun, and whose diameter are more than 500 times the diameter of the sun, since their light could not arrive at us. So what does it mean, since their light could not arrive at us? So let's just plug in some numbers. We know the solar mass, we know the solar radius, he says the density needs to be the same as the density of the sun. Density is the mass divided by, by volume. So for a sphere, the volume is just 4 over 3 pi r cubed. So if you put in this radius, 500 times the radius of the sun, what you have is a mass that is around 125 million times the mass of the sun. If you put that mass 
and that radius into the escape velocity, you find that you have a velocity that is greater than the speed of light. The speed of light is around 300,000 kilometers per second. An object that is 500 times bigger than the sun with the same density will have escape velocity that's greater than the speed of light. Of course, at the time, he just said at the end, and I quote here, he says, I shall not prosecute this any further. So why, <laughs> why did he choose to not look into this any further? You know, he just came up with this idea that there is a black hole. But the reason he said, I'm not going to investigate this any further is because at the time, he did not know that light could be affected by gravity. Okay, so he did not know that if you have a point source, a mass, he did not know that if you shine a laser beam that you would get bent. So we only really knew that after Albert Einstein. Okay, and he very cleverly said, well, I think that gravity can affect light. And you have this beautiful diagram, a little sketch that he has, that he made in 1914, where you can see here it's the sun, and there's a layer of, of uh, light, and you can see that it's being bent. So it wasn't until you know, 150 years later or so that somebody started to prosecute that idea again, okay? that they actually realized that the light can be bent. <laughs> and what Einstein did, and we're all very aware of, is you know, he came up with the idea of general relativity, where general relativity essentially is just linking gravity with space and time, and just trying to define all those three things into a number of equations. And he came up with 10 equations, which is called the Einstein field equation. And that looks pretty scary, but let's not worry too much about it. Um, so what that is doing, I think I'm going to try to, okay. So what this equation is doing is essentially linking time with space, okay? And this is what Einstein did. He, you know, he, he tried to kind of combine those two things and put gravity there as this fundamental thing. And it wasn't until 1915 that Einstein came up with his equations. And just about a year later, uh, this mathematician, Karl Schwarzschild, solved one of the equations and made this uh, metric that defines the space and time around the black hole. Okay, so he solved this equation about a year after Einstein came up with relativity, and then he died a year later because he joined the First World War, and he died of an uh, autoimmune disease in the trenches. So, sad story. But what, what does this metric define? What I want everybody to look at, look at and pay attention to is this value here, R over RS, okay? So that's just the radius. Now, this RS is the Schwarzschild radius. And if R, the radius, becomes equal to RS, we can just do some maths. RS divided by RS is 1. 1 minus 1 is 0. For the first term, this term here goes to 0, right? The second term, on the other hand, you have RS divided by RS. That's 1. 1 minus 1 is 0. And you note that that there is 0 to the power of minus 1. So it's 1 divided by 0. <coughs> 1 divided by 0 is infinity, right? So when this radius r becomes rs, this equation, this metric just essentially breaks down. It goes to infinity, all right? And this rs is the event horizon. So whenever you hear people say, well, the event horizon is this radius where light cannot escape, well, mathematically, this is what it is, is where this equation, this metric breaks down, OK? And the important thing is, any object can have an event horizon, okay? If you were to take, you know, I have the definition, the event horizon, the Schwarzschild radius is 2 gm over c squared. g is a constant, c is the speed of light, is a constant. So really, the only thing that you need to have an event horizon is mass, all right? So any object that has a mass will have an event horizon. If you take the mass of the sun and you compress the sun into a radius of about three kilometers, it will become a black hole with an event horizon. If you take Earth and you compress Earth to just about one centimeter, so the size of a grape, that will become a black hole and we will have an event horizon. So anything, I, you, everybody here can become a black hole. <laughs> now, the one simplification that, that, that Karl Schwarzschild did in that metric that I showed you, the scary looking metric, is that he assumed that this black hole is not rotating. Okay, so he assumed that there is no angular momentum in the black hole. In fact, what we know is that uh, everything rotates. You know, we are rotating around the sun. The sun is rotating around the center of the Milky Way. Everything is rotating around something. There's always angular momentum. So it's only logical that black holes will also be rotating. So if you put in this extra term, the spin, how fast it's spinning, this free 
and the charge, these three parameters essentially describe everything about a black hole. Okay? Now, in astronomy, we can pretty much just forget about charge. So it's because things uh, neutralize very quickly. If you have a positive charge, a negative charge, over astronomical time, they will just cancel each other out and be neutral. So let's just forget about charge. And then what we can say is that black holes have no hair. So what does that mean, that black holes have no hair? It means that they're very simple objects from a mathematical perspective. Okay? All you need is mass and spin. So whereas like, you and me, if we want to define a person, you probably say how, how tall he or she is, and you say whether or not they, you know, they have dark or light hair or blonde or black, and you probably talk about whether or not they support you know, the Wolverines. <laughs> black holes doesn't care about that. Right? Any kind of information, all this superfluous information, the moment it goes through the event horizon, it just gets converted to mass and angular momentum. So from a mathematical perspective, black holes have no hair. They're very simple objects and very easy to define. Of course, from a physical perspective, they are very complicated. They're very complex because despite their mathematical simplicity, the way that the black hole can interact with its surroundings with matter, within a galaxy, the way you can interact is very complex. Okay, so you have this kind of duality of being a very simple mathematical object that has so much complexities. So this is it for the mathematical background. What I'm going to talk now for a long time will be the more physical black holes. And we want to know, the first question we want to ask is, do they really exist? Do we have any proof that they exist? And one of the better places to look for proof of black holes will be the center of our own galaxy, because essentially it's our backyard. So let's look at uh, the center of our galaxy. So this is the, uh, an image of the Milky Way. If we were to zoom in by about 37,000, and we look straight into the galactic center, if you go down to the southern hemisphere, to Brazil, where I'm from, you have a much better look view of the Milky Way. But if you were to look at the galactic center, you see there's a little clusters of stars at the bottom right. So that's the galactic center. If we were to zoom in a little bit more, now a factor of 10, what we see is this. We see there are individual stars. And if we monitor those stars over the course of 15, 20 years, you know, every other day you take a little photo and you find out where the star is. And you do that for 15 years. You can actually see that the stars are rotating. And they're rotating in this like, very well-defined Keplerian orbit. Okay? So the same way that the Earth rotates around the Sun, and we can find out the properties of the Sun just by looking at the orbit, how long it takes to, you know, 365 days. That's just very well-defined Keplerian orbits that we've known for a very long time. And if we look at the stars in the center of the Milky Way, they're doing the same thing. The only difference is we are rotating around the Sun, and we can see the Sun. We can see that there is this very massive star at the center of our solar system. Whereas if we look at all these stars, they're rotating around a fake little star that somebody has put there. But that doesn't exist. Okay, that's not there. We can't see that star. And if you were to look at that, uh, you know, the star S2 star where the arrow is, the orbit of that star around this point source that nobody can see is about 15 years. Okay? And it gets very, very close. I'm going to just show here. It gets very close to that central point. And how close is close? Well, it's about six light years, uh, uh, light hours. So the distance, six light hours, is the equivalent of about the size of the solar system. OK, so it, we know that it takes eight minutes for the light from the sun to come to Earth. It takes six hours for the light from the sun to get all the way out to the end of the solar system. And this star here, S2, that one there, is rotating around something that has got to be smaller than six light hours, so smaller than the solar system. And just by analyzing the, the Keplerian orbit, we can very, very easily find the mass of this point source. right? And the mass that is enclosed within those six light hours, or 45 astronomical units, or solar system scale, is four million times the mass of the sun. So you have four million suns just packed into this space that is smaller than the solar system. Now, this is by far one of the best evidence for a black hole, because we, you know, physicists, scientists, cannot think of any other object that would have those densities other than being a black hole. Okay? 
So I'm going to move on a little bit and say, you know, I hope that everybody's convinced that black holes do exist. So if I manage to convince you that, then I, I can easily move on. Um, and I'll talk about astrophysical black holes. So you know, as I said before, a mathematical black hole could be anything. Anything that's got mass and you compress it, it could be a black hole. But what are the astrophysical black holes? What are the black holes that we actually see in physics and astronomy? And there are two general types of black holes that we observe. And these are defined into the stellar mass black holes. And the stellar mass black holes on the left are black holes that have a mass that is just about 10 times the mass of the sun. So not very massive, pretty puny. And then you have those supermassive black holes, which have masses that are millions to billions times the mass of the sun. And of course, you know, the more the, the stellar mass black holes, as I said, you know, the 10 times is, you can probably think that they're not very, uh, uh, very exciting, but well, 10 times the mass of the sun is pretty exciting anyway. So what I'm going to talk about for a little bit now will be how these stellar mass black holes are formed and how we can actually study them. Okay, so I'm going to concentrate a little bit more on the stellar mass black holes for, the for this first half of the talk. So how do they come about in the first place? Okay, so the stellar mass black holes are essentially the end point of stellar, of star, of stellar evolution. So when you have a very massive star and the star explodes, it will, it will blow away all of its material but the inner core of that star will become either a neutron star or a black hole. So here we're showing this uh, image of Cassiopeia A, it's a supernova. And you can kind of see that, you know, the, 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 if you look at the um, very inner part, there is this little um, dot. Okay? So this image is a composite image. It's, being com it's the combination of both infrared observation, visible, and x-ray. So x-rays is in is in bluish and green. And you can see that the central bit is this really nice little dot. That dot is a neutron star. So what it means is that when this star exploded, it wasn't massive enough to create a black hole. So what it left behind was a boring neutron star. And I say boring in, a, in quotes, because these stars have one to two times the mass of the sun in a space of about 10 kilometers. So it's definitely not very boring. But it just left a neutron star, and we can actually detect a neutron star. Now, if this supernova, if the star that exploded had been much more massive and it left a black hole behind, there would be nothing at the center and we would never be able to see the black hole, right? Because it would be inactive, because there would be no material, because this, the explosion blew away all the material. So how do we actually detect them? How do we see black holes? Well, luckily for us, at least a third, maybe even half of all the stars that we see are in binary systems. Okay, so that black hole, I mean, that neutron star that exploded was by itself, very likely, and it just exploded, and it's there by, you know, in the center by itself. If, on the other hand, we have this binary star system, where we have one star orbiting another, okay, and if one of those stars turns out to be very massive, I'll get to that in a second, but before, uh, I'll, I'll come back on that, but first thing is just to convince you that we do see binary star system is the fact that if we look at one of the most uh, famous stars in the night sky, definitely the brightest star in the night sky, Sirius, and that's in the constellation there, Canis Major, if you look at probably around 5 o'clock in the morning, if you go out tomorrow, then you can see it. It's actually a double star, okay? And you can see that the secondary star is right here. So we know they're there, and as I said, at least a third, if not half of them, are, are um, in these in, in this binary systems. So, just imagine, one of them explodes, one of them goes supernova, the core of that one that goes supernova becomes a black hole because the star is massive enough to become a black hole. And the secondary star did not escape, did not get pushed away. Let's just say that it stays there. Now you have a star and a black hole and they're orbiting each other. Okay? And this, of course, is what we see here, where we have at the top left, you have a black hole and you have this massive companion star here, and they're orbiting each other. And you might or might not have the enterprise there, but you definitely have the systems. <laughs> so how can we use this binary system to measure the mass of black hole? Well, not only the mass. We're interested in the fundamental parameters of a black hole, so we're interested in the mass and the spin, the two things that define a black hole. Well, I'm not going to be talking much about the mass, 
Suffice to say that we've known how to measure mass for a very long time. We just use Kepler's law. As I said, you know, the same way that we can define the orbit of Earth and all the other planets around the sun, it's a relatively well-known uh, way to uh, measure mass. And we have done this for some time now, not since 1619. Um, so I probably should not have that number there. But Kepler's law was 1619. But we've been measuring masses of black holes for the past 20 years or so. And the, what this diagram is showing on the left is just a schematic of uh, the dozen or so stellar mass black holes that we know of in our own Milky Way, in our own galaxy. And you can see the different sizes of them. So if we look at that GRS 1915, for example, you have the secondary star, which is this, uh, uh, this brown blob. And you have the black hole on the left. And you see that the size of that is just about the distance between the Sun and Mercury. Okay, so they're, they're really, really compact systems. Right? So it's half the distance between us and Earth. That's where the star and the black hole are in. So it's very compact. So we've been measuring masses for some time. And you can see on the right that is a compilation of, as I said, about a dozen black holes. And the masses are all between 3 to 10 times the mass of the sun. Stellar mass black holes. So they will be very close to the mass of the sun. What I'm more interested in, or what my career has uh, evolved about, is measuring the spin. OK, so I actually want to measure the angular momentum of the black hole. And I've defined the spin here to be between 0 and 1. So a spin that is 1 means that the black hole is rotating at the maximum rate that it can. A spin of 0 means that the black hole is not rotating. Just uh, one of those uh, simple things to say. It's virtually impossible to have a black hole that's not rotating, simply because everything is rotating. So the question is, is it very close to 0 or very close to 1, or somewhere in between? So. Before I say how we go about doing that, I will talk about why do we want to measure spin in the first place. So the first answer is obvious. If we know the mass and we know the spin, we know everything there is to know about a black hole, mathematically. So we really are probing strong gravity. What do I mean by that? I mean that we are solving, you know, we're, we're, we're probing general relativity. We're probing you know, gravity that is not just Newtonian, that is actually uh, general relativistic. The other thing is this application to supernova models. So as I said, if you have a stellar mass black hole, how do they come about? Well, it was a supernova. A star exploded, and the central core of that star becomes the black hole. And angular momentum, or spin, is conserved. Mass is conserved. Angular momentum is also conserved. So the spin of the black hole that is left behind will tell you something about how fast the star was rotating before it exploded. Okay, so measuring the spin does tell us about that. And very exciting for me is power, power, power. What do I mean by that? Well, I mean E equals MC squared. I'm sure everybody here has heard of E equals MC squared. There are loads of t-shirts that write it at their back. But the most powerful way of getting energy that we, you know, we are very familiar with is nuclear fusion. So that's just the sun. right? It's the sun is this fusion generator that is powering everything that we know on Earth. And if I tell you that the efficiency of that is less than 0.6% of E equals mc squared, 0.6%, which essentially means that it's not efficient at all. Black holes, on the other hand, they have an efficiency at converting mass into energy of anywhere between 10 to 40%. The only thing that is more efficient than a black hole at converting mass into energy is direct matter-antimatter annihilation. So if you have matter and antimatter, put them together, 100% efficiency. A black hole can get up to 40% of that. So it's way more efficient than our sun. So it's a very powerful engine. And, that's, you know, and when I said that it goes between 10 and 40%, it because it depends on the spin. If it's rapidly rotating, if the spin is 1, the efficiency is about, around 40%. So measuring the spin, you can determine the efficiency of this engines are converting matter into energy. And there's a whole other reason to measure spin, uh, which I will not talk about much. So how do we go about measuring spin? So the effects of spin is local. So what that means essentially is that whereas gravity, you can be very far away from the black hole, and you can just use Kepler's law to measure the mass. Spin, you need to be very close to the black hole. You need to be very close to the event horizon. Okay, um, And 
we need to be able to detect emissions coming from very close to the event horizon. Because as I said, the black hole by itself, if it's there by itself, it's by definition black, we cannot see it. So we need to be able to have material orbiting very close to the black hole, shining light, and we detect that light, and that's how we go about measuring spin. And we do. We do have material because we have the secretion disk. So again, think of the secondary star and you think of the black hole, it's sucking material from the secondary star. But in order to conserve angular momentum, everything is rotating, and it will form a disk. And that disk gets very close into the black hole, and that disk gets very hot, and it emits energy, emits radiation, and we detect that radiation. But how can we use the disk to study the spin? Okay. So luckily for us, there is this idea uh, that comes out straight out of general relativity, which is the idea of an innermost stable circular orbit. And the name says it all. How close to the event horizon can a, a disk or material, can matter, orbit, and remains in a stable circular orbit? So the Earth is in a stable circular orbit around the Sun. How close can material get to the black hole before it just collapses and goes straight in through the event horizon? And this innermost stable circular orbit depends on the spin. Okay, so for a black hole that's not spinning, where a is equal to zero, the innermost circular orbit goes, is around six times gm over c squared. Okay, gm over c squared, as I said before, for a black hole that's not spinning, the event horizon is at two times gm over c squared. So if I put in a black hole of 10 solar masses, this innermost stable circular orbit is around, what, 90 kilometers. However, if the black hole is spinning, the material can get much closer to the event horizon. In fact, the event horizon itself gets much closer to the singularity. And the ISCO, the innermost stable circular orbit, essentially goes all the way to the event horizon. And there is a very nice little linear relation that links the innermost stable circular orbit to the spin of the black hole. And you can see here. Now, just to put into perspective, if you have a maximum rotating black hole, a black hole that's rotating at the maximum, uh, at the maximum theoretical value, the innermost stable circular orbit is about 15 kilometers. Okay, so that's where the event horizon of this 10 solar mass black hole is. 15 kilometers. That's, you know, I, I think that's, that's nothing, right? <laughs> we, we drive 15 kilometers just to get here, most of us. Um, so it's really not much. So I've, I've, I've presented a lot of ideas here. I've presented the, the, the idea of binary systems. I've presented the idea of, uh, you know, I showed the mathematical definition of the event horizon. And uh, I talked about the no hair theorem, how you, you know, if you have the mass and the spin, you pretty much define a black hole. And uh, I also said that if you have a black hole by itself in space, you cannot see it. So for you, be, for you to be able to see it, you need to have the, the black hole accreting material. It needs to be feeding. Right? It needs to have a disk around it. And then it will uh, be seen. Luckily for us, there are quite a number of those. So now the, the, the next 20 minutes, I'll actually talk about how we go about doing this. Okay, so, so far, it's still been very theoretical. So how do we actually measure the, the accretion disk? How do we measure the spin? How do we see the disk? And the first thing that I need to point out, a little background, is the electromagnetic spectrum. Okay? So the black hole, you know, if you think of a normal star like the sun, it's, uh, the surface temperature is around 5,000, uh, 5, 5,500 degrees. So it's pretty hot. The material that is being sucked into the black hole forms an accretion disk is rotating. Okay? As it's rotating, there's a lot of friction because the material closer to the black hole is rotating a little bit faster than the material a little bit further away. So there's this rotational uh, friction that is, uh, that is heating up the material. And it will heat up the accretion disk to millions of degrees. So the, just before it goes through the event horizon, the temperature of the accretion disk is at millions of degrees. So it's radiating in millions of degrees. And here you can see that millions of degrees, if you look at the temperature scale here, it's around here. And that means that it's peaking in x-rays. Okay, the sun is peaking in optical, 5,000 degrees, optical. A million degrees is x-rays. And you can see from the top here that x-rays cannot penetrate the atmosphere. I guess that's a good thing, right? So how do we go uh, and measure these x-rays? We need to send big observatories into space. And this is the workhorse of a lot of the work that we do. Uh, it's an um, American um, telescope called Chandra. Um, and it looks, into, it, it looks everywhere, and it essentially is just detecting, uh, detecting x-rays. And what you see on the right is 
if you take this machine, this beautiful, beautiful telescope, and you point at the same place and leave it there for 10 days and 19 hours, you have this really overexposed uh, field. And this is the Chandra Deep Field. And every single point that you see there are things that are radiating at millions of degrees, and they're all black holes. Okay, so every single one of the points that you see there are supermassive black holes, not the stellar mass. So these are the ones that are millions times the mass of the sun, but every single one of them are black holes. But then again, I you know, go back to ask, how do we make sense of what we see? If we just see x-rays, what exactly are we seeing? What is Chandra detecting? Okay, so this is it's a little bit more uh, complex, what I'll be talking about in the next few minutes, but think of Chandra seeing, essentially what it's doing, it's measuring how much x-ray light it's seen as a function of energy. And it produces something we call a spectrum, uh, or a spectrum, because this is singular. And for each one of those energy beams, it's finding out how bright something is shining. Okay? And this is a spectrum. But we see this and we think, okay, what does this mean? Right? And we try to decompose the spectrum into actual uh, physical things that we imagine is happening around the black hole. So I've been saying a lot that there is an accretion disk. And this accretion disk essentially radiates the spectrum that looks like that red spectrum, right? And then there's also this corona thing that I'm pointing out here. And we know it's there because the data from Chandra and other satellites shows that there is a lot of energy going at very, very high energies, a lot of emission at high energies. So what is this corona? I go back to the sun again. Okay, we know the, sun is, the surface of the sun is around 5,000 degrees, but we see this beautiful uh, emission coming from the solar corona having temperatures of millions of degrees. So despite the fact that you have a surface of 5,000 degrees, you have this emission at millions of degrees. So the same thing we think is happening around black holes, where we have a corona, and we have the accretion disk. And the other thing that we have is this other little dent here in the data. And that dent, we think, is something that we call reflection. So imagine you have the corona, and the corona is shining down the accretion disk. Okay? And go back to the lab a little bit. Imagine you have an X-ray gun, and you're shining down into an atom. Okay? And what I'm trying to describe here is just fluorescence. So basically, you shine down the X-ray into an atom. That X-ray has got a lot of energy, so it's going to knock out some electrons. Okay? The moment it, it knocks out the electron, the, the atom becomes excited. And then other electrons with very specific energies is going to go back down to the ground level in order to feel the ground level, and it will radiate a very specific energy. Okay, so that's just fluorescence. And we do that uh, a lot here on Earth. And I have my only experiment here is this. Imagine that light, that lamp, is your corona. It's something that's on top of the accretion disk. And it shines down the accretion disk, and this is not working. Oh, it is working. There you go. And you see that it's fluorescing. Okay? So what the lamp is doing, it's shining, energy, shining light that is more energetic than the accretion disk, which in this case is the fluorescence dye. And it excites the dye, or in this case it excites the atoms in the accretion disk, and it will send out a very specific signal. Okay? So that's just fluorescence. And the exact same thing is happening around these black holes. Well, you have the corona, the corona is shining down on the accretion disk. And what we find here is, here I have three different dyes, right? Well, around the accretion disk, we find that there is loads of iron and a lot of other elements, okay? Now remember, if this is a stellar mass black hole, it was born out of a, out of a supernova explosion. When the supernova exploded, it produced a lot of iron. So there's bound to be a lot of iron in that accretion disk. And we do see that because we see emission coming from iron that is very specific. Now, in a lab like here, if I was to do a, spec, you know, a, a, a spectrographic analysis of, the, of those dyes, I would have a very nice little signal, a little peak at the specific frequency of green, yellow, and pink. All right? And here, I have a very nice little peak at the specific frequency of iron. However, we are not doing this in a lab. We're doing this around the black hole. Okay, so if you're shining down an accretion disk, and the accretion disk is very close to the event horizon, it's trying to fluoresce, and it will fluoresce, but for it to escape the accretion disk and come to us, it needs to lose a lot of energy, because gravity is saying, I'm not letting you go. I don't want to lose the light that's coming out. I'm bending the light back towards me. So you lose a lot of energy. 
So the difference between these two kind of spectrum where you have the yellow one that looks pretty narrow as you'd expect if it was not coming from close to a black hole and then you have this other one here which is very broadened and very skewed simply because it's trying to fight gravity. You're trying to get fluorescence out of something that's close to a black hole. Right? So how is it that we can use this information to find out how close to the black hole it's, the fluorescence is coming from? Well, the closer it is to the black hole, the more energy it loses, the more skewed the line profile becomes. And by studying this line profile in detail, we can find out exactly how close to the black hole the material was. If we know how close to the black hole the material was, and we associate that with the innermost stable circular orbit, I showed everyone before that there's a very nice little linear relation between innermost stable circular orbit and spin. So by studying the fluorescence emission, we can find out how close to the black hole that light came from. And we can find out whether or not the black hole is spinning. So we've, you know, we've done this um, for a number of sources, for a, a, about a dozen or so stellar mass black holes. And one of the very famous ones is this one, is the GX59-4. So this is uh, the galactic X-ray number 349, very original. And what we have is that we have this companion star we have a black hole. The black hole is sucking material from the star, causes an accretion disk. The accretion disk is very, very hot, emitting at millions of degrees in X-rays. And what we see is this emission line, this fluorescence line. And this, the dotted line here is 6.4 keV, exactly what we expect emission from iron, fluorescence from iron. And you can see that it's nowhere near a nice little straight line. It's actually very broad and very curved. I mean, instead of 6.4 kV, this is going down all the way to 3 kV. So it's losing a lot of energy as it's trying to escape from close to the black hole. So by using this methodology, we can actually determine how close to the black hole the emission is coming from, and we can measure the spin. And we've done this for, as I said, about a dozen or so sources in our local neighborhood or our galaxy. And uh, one thing I would like to note is, look at the dates of the publications, right? This is all 2008, 9, 10, 11, 12. So this is things that's happening right now. The, the level of precision that we need to be able to measure the actual shape of the fluorescence line is so precise that we've only really been able to do this in the past few years, okay? We've been measuring black hole mass for a little bit longer than this. But what we're doing here is studying the innermost regions around the black hole. So it's pretty exciting and very new stuff. And one of the things that you also notice is that the values for the spin, which is supposed to be between 0 and 1, it does vary a little bit, right? It goes from you know, 0.98 to all the way down to 0. So there is this diversity in the values of the spin. So what, is that, what does that mean? Does it mean that the supernova that exploded, the, can a, a star just explode? If it's just standing there rotating a little bit, can it just explode? Or does it have to be rotating very fast to explode? Well, these results right now suggest that they can explode with any amount of rotation. Um, but it's still very preliminary. So what I would like to talk to you about in the next uh, 15 minutes or so is this other aspect of, of, uh, of the work that I do, which is looking at bigger black holes, which is looking at the supermassive ones. So for everything that I said so far is the stellar mass. So now let's look at uh, black holes that have masses millions times the mass of the sun, and I have this really badly titled uh, slide, Hearing Black Holes. And the reason I say badly titled is because we obviously cannot hear black holes, because we all know that sound cannot travel in space in a vacuum, pardon me. Uh, if you shout in screen, nobody, shout in space, nobody will hear you, if, you know, we, we know that. So what do I mean by hearing black holes? And I'll, I'll get to that answer in about five minutes. But first I'm going to show this again. So let's go back to a smaller scale, go back to the stellar mass black holes. And here we have the Crab Nebulae, right? So this is a, uh, a star that exploded, and it was seen by Chinese astronomers in 1054. And it was noted as a guest star because it was so bright. I think it was four or five times brighter than Venus when it exploded. And the actual the remnant of the star, so the core of the star, became a neutron star. Again, not massive enough to become a black hole, but massive enough that it's, it becomes a neutron star. And that there is going to be right in the center. And we can't see it. The reason we can't see it is because the scale of this nebulae, which, by the way, 
we see it, it's expanding. You know, so the, some of these nebulae, so the, the other one that I showed before, the Cassiopeia A, uh, right at the beginning of the talk, that supernova remnant is expanding. Now, if we look 10 years ago, now it's bigger, simply because it's an explosion, and it is still expanding, right? The core of this star, of this uh, explosion, is just about 10 kilometers. So here's a scale of 11 light years. 10 kilometers is much smaller. Um, but what we see is, if we look at this, uh, the core, so now we're zooming in very close to the core. On the left, we have X-rays. So this is the Chandra uh, mission that I showed earlier. And on the right is Hubble. Okay. I'm going to play a little movie. And what you will see is that there appears to be uh, shock waves that's propagating out from the center. So there's little pulses that's coming out. Of course, the fact that I have pulsar at the top kind of gives it away that there's going to be pulses there. But you will see them very quickly. Uh, not that one. Let's see. Can everyone see it? So you have all these nice little poses. Now zooming in. That little dot at the center is the neutron star. Okay? And you can see these beautiful shock waves and it's just pulsating. Right? Now, if we were to measure how much, how bright this, the, the central core is as a function of time, we'll get something that we call a light curve. So it's just a time series, how bright something is as a function of time. It's a light curve. And you look at that and you think, eh, there's nothing there. That's just a lot of noise. Right? That's what I think when I see that. And I'm going to show you very quickly that this is not the case. But before that, I'm going to introduce this little mathematical trick that we use, which is called uh, the Fourier theory or Fourier transform. And what it does is this. Imagine you have a sine wave or any kind of signal. And you want to break down the signal into its most basic uh, components. So what a Fourier transform here is doing, so if you look at the top panel, and you look at the big yellow one at the bottom, let's see if I get to, oh, here we go. So if you look at that, if I say to you that this is the contribution of this sine wave, that sine wave, and that sine wave, you might look at it and go, eh, sure, I believe it, right? Well, it is. Now. If I were to do a Fourier transform of this specific sine wave, which is that one there, and I change, I change from intensity as a function of time, so how bright it is as a function of time, and I do this mathematical trick, and I plot how powerful it is as a function of frequency, so I go from intensity to power and time to frequency, you see that it, break, it, it pulls out from this data these three little uh, peaks, and these three peaks are the exact frequency of these three waves that goes into it. And how high it is, so the amplitude of those peaks, tells you the amplitude of the waves that went in to make this complicated uh, signal. Okay? So this is a mathematical trick that you're just going to have to believe me works. So what happens when we do the same thing to that little noisy crab pulsar data that I showed you? Well, if you do the field transform from the top from here to here, first thing you see is that it does pull out these really nice little frequencies. This frequency here is the fundamental, so that's 30 hertz. Okay, so there is a signal here, a sine wave, that is very, very coherent, and the frequency of that is 30 hertz. Now, if I were to zoom in into this light curve, you can probably by eye see that there is a period, right? You can see that there's something that goes ooh, up and down at that period of 0.03 seconds. Period and frequency are one over each other, so they're related by one over period is the frequency. So you can see that if you were to use your eyes, you can probably tell what the Fourier transform is screaming at you. Right? So what is going on in that crab poster? So what we think is going on is that there was, well, we know there was an explosion that made the nebulae. We know that the core of the star that exploded became a neutron star. And this neutron star is rotating, and it's pulsating. And it's a little bit of the lighthouse effect, where every time it's shining at you, you see a big pulse, and it gets brighter. Okay? And then when it's going away from you, it gets fainter. And it's doing that at a frequency of 30 hertz. So the next slide is going to show a little movie of that. So there you have the component star, and you have the Christian disk being formed. And we're zooming in closer and closer to uh, the neutron star now. And it's rotating because everything is rotating. Okay, and you have this 
beautiful light that's coming, beautiful jets that's coming out. And very quickly, it will kind of settle down into this very fast spin period. And what we're seeing is that flickering. Every time that comes at us, we're seeing that, uh, that flickering, and it's going at a frequency of 30 hertz. So it's rotating very, very fast. But of course, not everything is so simple, right? With that previous, uh, that, that previous thing, if we zoomed in close enough, you'd look and you go, OK, I see the period, right? But sometimes it, it's not that simple. Why not? Because whereas in that signal there was very little noise, what we often find is that the data <laughs> contains a lot of noise. Okay? But of course, you know, as, I, as I have here, one person's noise is another's data. So how can we use the noise to actually learn something about, um, about a system? Pardon me. So a little bit more background here, and we have uh, if you have musicians in the, in the house, you probably know about pink noise and red noise, but for those who can't, who does not know about uh, these different types of noises, I'm just going to say, um, uh, let's just do a little quote first, right? The Oxford English Dictionary, what is noise? It's a random fluctuation that contains no meaningful data. I don't think that's the case at all, at least in science. Meaning, you know, noise can contain a lot of data. And, here is an example of a white noise. If, if, you, if you were to compare these three different curves, maybe the middle one looks pretty different. But you probably couldn't say that there's anything fundamentally different between them anyway. Because our eyes just look at it and just see a lot of uh, noise. Our ears, on the other hand, and our brains can do this sphere transform very nicely. So here's the sound of white noise. And you very quickly that's very different right and finally if you have your brown it's again very different so what our brains are doing is doing this Fourier transform and if you were to do the Fourier transform here you see that they look dramatically different between uh, between these three different types of noises but again, not everything is so simple, because a lot of times we have all these noises together. Okay? There's no reason why something needs to be just pure white noise or pure brown noise. A lot of times they just come all together in one big happy package. And this is what we have here. Just if you do the power spectrum, if you see here again that the white noise is just, it comes out as a nice little straight line in the, uh, in the power versus frequency domain. And that's this here, power, frequency, there's your white noise, and here's your 1 over f noise, and it all combines into each other. So that was a little bit of introduction, because you needed to know this so you understand what I'm going to talk about next. What I'm talking about next is this. Um, a couple of years ago, in 2011, there was this satellite called SWIFT. It's a relatively small satellite. So I talked to you about Chandra, which is a big, big, big satellite. Uh, and this one, SWIFT, is relatively small. But the reason it's small is because its job is to swiftly move around. Because what it wants to do is, if something goes bang over here, I want to be able to look at it very quickly. If you have a really, really big workhorse, it takes a long time to kind of change its orbit. Whereas Swift just points at it very quickly. And what it did in 2011, it looked at a point in the sky that something had happened. There was a big a surge of energy, of radiation in that part of the sky that wasn't there before. Okay? And then he looked at it, and he kept looking at it for a very long time. So the, if you look at here, on the y-axis you have the x-ray brightness, and then the y-axis, on the x-axis you have the time. So time zero is this date, 28th of March, 2011. And you see that it was very, very, it became very bright, and Swift looked at it, and this gray light curve is just you know, Swift would look at it every day, and every day he would note how bright it was, and he would just keep that, and he would plot a light curve of brightness versus time. And you can see that now, it's gone much fainter. This is a log scale, so this is 100, 10, and 1, so it's gone down by a factor of 1,000, and this is 200 days, so right now it's pretty much not there anymore. Now, about nine days after Swift first detected this, um, this explosion, uh, one of the big satellites actually 
you know, had enough time to maneuver itself, to look at it, and it observed it. And that was this first observation here that I marked as a, a blue star. And then, of course, every other satellite and every other telescope on Earth looked at it one point or another. Now, when we did the light curve, now, SWIFT is a very small telescope, so it doesn't gather a lot of data. Okay? It, it can tell you that there is something bright, but it doesn't know exactly how, you know, how much fluctuation it happens. It's a small little light bucket. The big ones, on the other hand, could actually monitor exactly the fluctuation in light over a period of a day or so. And you can see that there is this um, light curve. Again, X-ray brightness as a function of time. This is time as a in 1,000 seconds. The little gaps here is the fact that the satellite is in orbit around Earth. And you can imagine it's pointing over there, but when Earth is in the way, it can't observe. So that's the gaps in the light curve. So every time it goes, the, 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 the source gets blocked away. Um, now, if you were to do this like, mathematical trick that I showed you before into this specific light curve, you get this nice little peak here. Okay? Now, with the pulsar, with the crab pulsar that I showed before, when we saw the little peak that was extremely coherent, and I said that that was the fundamental 30 hertz, that was, it was pretty easy to explain what was going on. Because you can think of a pulsar, you think of a lighthouse, it made sense. So what is this? So what is, what is this peak here? What do we think is going on? It was an object that wasn't there before, and then it is. And suddenly there is this extra power happening at this specific frequency. So, Last bit of equation, I promise. Going back to the Keplerian equation, okay, we know the, the Kep, Kepler's equation here that defines how planets orbit around stars and everything else. If we were to make the very basic assumption that the mass of a black hole or the mass of one specific object is much more massive than the other, one of the masses can be canceled out. Right? So you can look at this equation, you can go, okay, mass of black hole is much bigger than the mass of a planet or anything else, so you can get rid of that one. Come down to this equation here, and you have p squared. Take the square root of both sides. Take the square root of both sides, you only have this equation. As I said before, the frequency is equal to 1 divided by the period. Okay? So just do 1 over it, and you have this equation. Right? Now, if we were to say, okay, g we know, it's gravitational constant. We have a mass, and we have a radius. Now, let's assume that this is a black hole that is not spinning, and it has a radius of six gravitational radii. So that's the ISCO. Let's just put that here just for sake of argument now. And we can uh, put in a couple of numbers there, so we can normalize the mass to be in terms of one million times the mass of the sun. And we see that the frequency that we expect for an accretion disk, okay, the accretion disk around, that is in orbit around a black hole, and the orbit is the ISCO, the innermost stable circular orbit, that frequency for a black hole that's 10 million, that is 1 million times the mass of the sun is in the order of millihertz, which is what we find here, 5 millihertz. Okay? So what we think is going on is that that frequency there is telling you something fundamental about how close to this black hole and I still haven't convinced everybody that that was a black hole in the first place. I just said that there was an explosion in the sky that happened somewhere that something happened where it wasn't there before. I didn't say it was a black hole, but obviously I will say it's a black hole. Um, so we, we think that this frequency is that frequency of the ISCO. Okay, so what do we actually think is going on? We think that there was a point in the sky where there was a black hole, and this black hole is just there minding its own business. Okay? It's minding its own business at uh, 3.4 billion light years away. We know that because after the explosion happened, we measured the redshift and we can actually measure how far away that explosion happened. Okay? So now we know that something happened 4 billion light years away, so it's very far when the universe was relatively young. Okay? And it was minding its own business by itself. If there's no material to accrete, that black hole, we cannot see it. What happened is we think that there's a star that got too close to the black hole. Okay, the star is orbiting, and somehow it just got a little bit too close. Gravity is pulling it, and then the black hole says, all right, I'll have you. All right? And it, dis it disturbed the star. It broke the star apart, and the star got disrupted. And the material from the star essentially fed the black hole. Okay? But of course, a star has only 
you know, a specific amount of mass, right? So after the black hole has consumed all of it, it will go back to being dormant. So when you see that light curve and you say, okay, 28th of March 2011, it was really bright. 200 days later, it's already gone down by you know, a factor of 1,000. And I tell you now, believe me, that it's not there no more. It's simply because it consumed all of this matter from the star. So now, what is this, uh, that's the frequency that I showed you? That is the frequency of the innermost stable circular orbit. Okay? And I'm going to show you a nice little movie. And of course, if you were to plug in the, the actual frequency that we found, that was uh, you know, 5 hertz, so a period of 200 seconds, you plug in into that very simple Keplerian equation, we have a black hole of a mass of 2.3 times, uh, uh, 2.3 million. So I'm going to show you a nice little movie now where, uh, forgive me the music, it was uh, NASA that chose to put that. before it went past the event horizon. So now the reason this is fascinating is because it happened four billion light years away. So when I said before, when I had my slide, why do we want to measure spin? You know, and I said power, power, power. You know, I emphasize power because these are extremely powerful things. I mean, this particular example here that happened four billion light years ago, away, or four billion years ago, um, it, it became really so bright that we could detect it here. Okay? And I haven't really I told you a lot about quasars simply because I've only got a few more minutes, but you know, the supermassive black holes that are in the center of all these galaxies can be extremely powerful. They can be so powerful that it can affect how the galaxy grows. So these black holes are extremely energetic. They're very important um, for the evolution of galaxies and how we actually came to be. Yet, I told you at the beginning of the talk that they're very simple. They, they only really have mass and spin and no hair whatsoever. So I think this kind of idea that you have such a simple object, mathematically, that can have such a powerful uh, impact on you know, everything, on the center of galaxies, it, it, for me, is remarkable. And you know, I, I don't know if we're ever going to be able to have black hole powered spaceships. Okay, I think Star Trek has taught us that matter antimatter is the best way to go. <laughs> but this is the second best. <laughs> but what I do know is that we do have black holes that are powerful enough to influence galaxies and influence all of us. So, thank you very much.